Hello and greetings from Bombay, India. This is Dr. Abhishek Mangeshika here to talk to you about endometriosis in Southeast Asia. I want to talk to you about the current scenario and where we're heading. I'm the founder and director of ICE. I'm a gynecologist, but my practice only deals with endometriosis and its related disorders. I receive no financial support from the medical or the surgical industry. So the objectives of this talk are going to be a basic overview on endometriosis, although I'm sure everyone is quite familiar with the subject. I want to talk about the situation in India and Southeast Asia. We're going to go over some myth busting and then some takeaway messages. So let's talk about what endometriosis is. It's a benign disease outside the uterus. It bears a passing resemblance to native endometrium with distinctive features of inflammation, neoangiogenesis, neoneurogenesis, scar tissue, and fibrosis. Symptomatology is very important for endometriosis. Uh, the symptoms extend way beyond more than just a painful period. A patient's symptoms are very important from a clinical point of view, which I will elaborate further on. Um, so, for example, deep dyspareunia is very suggestive of rectovaginal disease. And if the patient has uh, dysuria, where the bladder has to be pressed upon to, uh, to empty the bladder, is very suggestive of involvement of the parametrium and the lateral uh, nerves in the uterosacral parametrial complex. So let's look at some of the common misdiagnoses that endometriosis is often mistaken for. Anything from IBS to PCO to depression to an overactive imagination and uh, a painful period is normal, it's part of growing up or being a woman. Um, so the lens that gynecology goes to to prove that endometriosis is not actually endometriosis is actually quite unbelievable. Misdiagnosis and extended trials of medication, hormonal or uh, analgesic, abound and in my opinion are one of the main reasons as to why there is such a delay in diagnosis. We have different types of endometriosis and it presents in different subtypes. We can categorize them as follows, uh, as peritoneal lesions, as deep endometriosis, as ovarian endometriotic or chocolate cysts. And then we have adenomyosis. I do mention adenomyosis because although it is a separate entity from endometriosis, I do believe that rectocervical disease is an adenomyomatous nodule of the cervix. We have some laparoscopic images here demonstrating the subtle differences in appearance of peritoneal lesions. So, you, As you can see in the top left, uh, that is the standard laparoscopic view and you can maybe pick up one or two lesions. But when you come in a lot closer, you can identify about four different presentations of peritoneal disease from neovascularization to the typical hemorrhagic powder burn lesions and then you lower down you can see some white fibrotic lesions and uh, towards the midline you see the clear vesicular lesions and on the next slide you'll see the same area after wide local excision has been performed on the disease so this was a good slide i found online elucidating the differences between ablation and excision and now there is numerous evidence that excision is the gold standard with regards to improving pain scores and drastically reducing recurrence rates. Um, ablation is a very quick process. It does not give you a histological specimen. It, in my opinion, only takes care of the tip of the iceberg and leaves disease behind. Therefore, recurrence rates are going to be much higher with ablation. While excision is technically harder to perform, it does give you a histological specimen and it 
has a wide excision, so your chances of recurrence are much lower if done correctly. So deep endo is nodular disease. Um, it grows between the rectum and the cervix. It grows sometimes between the rectum and the vagina as well. It can extend laterally to the uterosacral ligaments and it, if it extends further, it involves nerves and the ureters. It can grow anteriorly to involve the bladder and it can also uh, reach extra pelvic sites like the small bowel, the appendix, the diaphragm, uh, lung and cutaneous sites. So diagnosis is the most important uh, part of evaluating a patient with endometriosis. And the most important step in diagnosing is to listen to the patient. Um, history taking and going through the past records is a very important step. It's not just about a painful period. It's uh, about the pain, the duration of the pain, the onset of the pain, uh, alleviating factors, exacerbating factors, where there's radiation of the pain, if it's a diffuse pain or a localized pain would suggest a difference between visceral pain and sensory uh, nerve involvement. Types of pain and their location. So you have to give uh, the patient enough time. You cannot schedule an appointment for 15 or 20 minutes uh, and do justice to an endometriosis patient. An endometriosis consult with me I schedule for about one and a half to two hours. Um, history taking is a very important step. And when it comes to the examination, these women have pain. There is always some degree of uh, maybe because of the neuro neurogenesis, there is some degree of sensitization. So a gentle exam has to be performed as gentle as possible. If a pelvic exam can be done, a one finger pelvic exam may be attempted if she has a lot of pain. Uh, if it's absolutely impossible, this examination can be deferred to examine nodularity while the patient is under anesthesia after uh, procuring the required consent. Um, a speculum exam to visualize the posterior cervix to make sure that there is no infiltration into the vagina is very important and should not be missed so as to not leave disease behind. If there is involvement into the vagina, the uh, vagina has to be excised as well. When it comes to diagnostics, there's a lot of literature and there's two schools saying that it's always ultrasound versus MRI, uh, but it's very subjective. It's uh, who is performing the ultrasound and who is interpreting the MRI. So it should be done in a multidisciplinary setup with experts in all relevant aspects of endo. And there is literature showing that sigmoid lesions are impossible to detect with ultrasound. So the way I do it is I perform my own ultrasound as a triage for my patients. Um, if I pick up a nodule on the bowel on ultrasound, then I will always get an MRI done. Also, because our center in uh, Mumbai receives patients from out of state and out of country uh, as well, uh, it's more convenient for patients to email me the digital MRI so that I can review the film myself, mark it up and send it back to them. And I also involve my radiologist who has a special interest in endometriosis to reach a good diagnosis. So we're very well prepared before we actually see the patient. It's easy to appreciate the disease on MRI. Um, here you can see uh, the anterior wall of the rectum is invaded, uh, infiltration and in up to the muscularis. And this one is an Endometriosis protocol MRI, which we do at our center, where the vagina and the rectum are infused with gel uh, to better highlight the rectovaginal septum. 
which will pick up even the smallest nodules and give us a better understanding of our surgical plan. We always compare ultrasound findings with the MRI findings. As you can see in this case, there's a bowel nodule um, and also the uterosacral infiltration on the left side and a small endometrioma as well. There's a lot of research and media hype about uh, blood tests for endometriosis, but at the moment, there are none that are significant enough to be used as a diagnostic or a triage test. When we come to who should operate on endometriosis, it's always a big debate whether it should be done by gynecologists, and then it comes to what kind of gynecologist should treat the patient. Should it be a laparoscopic surgeon versus a fertility surgeon or a fertility specialist versus a gynae oncologist? Um, should the urologist do it? Should the colorectal do it? Or should the general surgeon do it? Inadequate treatments from experienced laparoscopic surgeons, untrained in excision surgery for endometriosis, were almost up to 35% after the post-operative period. Hence emerged the era of the laparoscopic pelvic surgeon. When gynae oncology developed as a subspecialty and tumor boards were developed, ovarian cancer survival rates improved. Similarly, endometriosis needs its own subspecialty with a multidisciplinary approach. We have a colorectal, a fertility specialist, a urologist, a pelvic physiotherapist, a specialist anesthesiologist, and specialist nurses involved with the team. Each case should be discussed individually to tailor the radicality of the surgery to the patient's needs. We have monthly audits to analyze our mistakes and what could have been done to suggest improvements. Now let's go over some common myths in endometriosis or frequently asked questions. So a lot of patients will always ask, do I need a hysterectomy? Do I need to have my ovaries removed? A lot of physicians also suggest a hysterectomy and removal of the ovaries as a, a definitive treatment for endometriosis. So by definition, endometriosis is outside the uterus. So hysterectomy is not a treatment for endometriosis unless there's an accompanying uterine pathology like very severe adenomyosis or multiple fibroids. And you see in the literature that the retreatment rates for patients undergoing hysterectomy were up to 5.4%. And then a more recent study in uh, when there was uh, conservation of the ovaries after hysterectomy, the re recurrence rates were up to 60%. The second most commonly asked question is, do I need IVF? In gynecological circles, there's always the great debate about who should go first. Should you do the IVF first or should you get the surgery first? There's a classic example of a young patient who wants to get pregnant and after trying to conceive naturally for four to six months with rapidly increasing cyclic pain, presents with colorectal endometriosis <clears throat> and it's just been four to six months. In theory, this interval is too sh short to dub her as infertile. So then comes the question of whether to treat the pain or the fertility. So of course the patient is frightened by the danger of infertility and she will probably answer that I want to get pregnant. So the physician says, I propose ART management by IVF and she is sent for multiple IVF treatments. The problem is that the question itself is wrong because it suggests that the two goals cannot be achieved simultaneously. Furthermore, as she undergoes an IVF, 
she will automatically be recorded as infertile in the physician's database and will forever require IVF in the future. The study by Professor Roman shows that excisional surgery allows conception rates of around 80% within the first year of after surgery. This is for colorectal DIE. 60% out of these 80% conceived naturally and the remaining conceived via ART procedures. Excisional surgery dramatically improves IVF outcomes. The third question we always deal with is why does medical therapy fail? Medical therapy fails when there is any obstructive uropathy. The premise of medical therapy is based on suppression of eutopic endometrium. Now we know that endometriosis and endometrium are two different entities. So they do not behave similarly under the influence of hormones. They're not estrogen sensitive, they are hormone sensitive. Medical therapy also fails dramatically in case of subocclusive bowel stenosis. If there are complex adnexal cysts or endometriomas more than four centimeters, Medical therapy as a whole aims to suppress the disease, to suppress the symptoms rather than cure the disease. And all medical therapy is fertility suppressing rather than enhancing. And hopefully this question no longer persists, but it was touted as the treatment for endometriosis in the past. And we of course know that this myth is slowly disappearing and like hormone treatments, pregnancy may temporarily suppress the symptoms of endometriosis, but it does not eradicate the disease itself. Therefore, symptoms usually recur after the birth of the child. The struggles we face in India, I suppose, are similar across the globe. We have, from the grassroots level, we have wrong definitions and causes taught in medical school. That's why the time from diagnosis from the onset of symptoms is between 7 to 12 years. Among OBGYs, the training is suppression is the first line of treatment. So a patient walks in with pelvic pain. She is immediately given non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Or if she's older, she's put on the pill. There is no training curriculum for laparoscopy let alone for excisional surgery. And women are told to just get pregnant. Which, bearing these challenges, I set up trying to create an educational resource to enable patients to self-advocate and physicians to self-educate. And finally, ICE was born, and I'm happy to say that we have become the number one resource in the country in two years which actually wasn't very difficult because there weren't too many. Our goals are to create awareness about the disease, to educate women and physicians about early diagnosis and correct treatments. And like any resource, the challenges are always about curating and creating content. So in conclusion, I'd like to give a couple of takeaway messages that it's important to form partnerships between patient associations and endometriosis centers. Uh, primary care physicians should be able to diagnose and direct uh, patients to endometriosis centers. And the goal of ICE is to be a knowledge-based resource for patients and physicians to identify specialty centers across the country. And we must remember that we need to manage the patient depending upon the symptoms and what her goals are. Incomplete and inadequate surgical therapies by inexperienced surgeons lead to frustrated patients who end up having unnecessary hysterectomies and oophorectomies at an early age. So thank you for tuning in during these times of quarantine. Uh, we are kind of drawing the attention back ever so briefly to endometriosis during the awareness month to show our women and our patients that they are not forgotten even in spite of all this crisis going around so i hope everybody's safe where they are and if you have any questions
please feel free to leave them in the comments and I'll get back to you.